thank you for inviting me here today. Um, so when Mark called me a while back and said, hey, will you come speak to this conference about uh, infrastructure finance, I said, okay. And he said, what are your thoughts on public banking? And I said, I don't have too many well-developed thoughts. Um, I told him my profession these days is more as a diet. I diagnose things within society and I don't prescribe solutions so much. So it's um, pretty interesting to sit through some of these other presentations and see some of the solutions uh, to the various problems that we're talking about. I'm going to talk about a problem having to do with the means by which powerful concentrated pools of private capital extract value from public infrastructure. And that's sort of what I do mostly now in my day job. I, uh, I, I read a lot of boring documents and I look at a lot of um, economic and, and, and financial data and I try to figure out how powerful business entities uh, squeeze uh, value, squeeze wealth, do dollars or whatever uh, from diffused publics or consumers and so forth. And if you think about what, what that means, it means that uh, these, these, these often aren't cr you know, criminal activities. These are often perfectly legal activities. Sometimes they're criminal, sometimes they Im involve uh, bending the rules around a little bit. But oftentimes we're talking about the theft of millions, hundreds of millions, even in the billions of dollars uh, by these powerful organizations. And it often goes unnoticed and uncriticized because the way that they do it is they're just vacuuming up the dimes and the nickels and the pennies that are sort of out there and no one, no, no one notices that this is happening. So you, you, have to, you have to pay really close attention. So that's something I've been doing with, with infrastructure. And so I'll, I'm, I'm gonna run through um, some stuff with you all and try to explain what is the, the current state, the, the new privatization um, P3. Uh, has anyone heard of the notion of the public-private partnership? Okay, so this is a savvy audience and you probably all know what this is all about already. Um, but pub public-private partnerships, this is the new privatization. Um, so if you ever hear that word on the news, if you ever read it in the newspaper, if a politician ever advocates utilizing a public-private partnership to procure infrastructure, Basically, insert privatization where they say public-private partnership. Um, public-private partnership, or P3, is a euphemism for privatization. It is different, though, in a key sense, and I'll explain that in a minute, and hopefully this works. Okay, yes. Uh, so, bo boring, too long quote. Sorry, I stuck this in here right, right off the bat. Um, E.S. Savas, he's a um, professor at... Um, CUNY, he's, he's uh, one of the intellectual proponents of the, the new privatization these days. He's not, the, he's not the most powerful one, but I thought this quote was pretty good because to privatize infrastructure today, a lot of the proponents say that, well, you know, um, uh, the United States has always had private, private infrastructure finance, privatized infrastructure, and so this is like going back to the good old days of the American Revolution and, you know, um, the good old days of 18 and, and early 1900s um, in the United States. And so this, this particular individual, th this is an argument that you will see expressed a lot in the coming political debate about public-private partnerships. And I say the coming, the coming political debate because this is, this, is gonna, this is already here in California. There's already privatized infrastructure. It's going to get a lot uh, more intense in the very near future here. Um, so. This is a this is an aqueduct. This is a portion of the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal was, of course, um, not private, not really, not public, not really. It was sort of the one of the early quasi-public-private things. But you know, this, the state um, did essentially um, underwrite that infrastructure project. Um, this is Laurel Valley Plantation in Louisiana. A lot of the infrastructure in the American South was fully privatized. This 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 particular canal runs along these slave shacks. Um, the, pl the plantation owner here built this canal so that they could barge their um, sugar to markets. And I, I put this slide in here just so we also think, you know, it's not, let's, let's think in a bigger picture when we talk about um, infrastructure. It's not just about how it gets financed and how it gets, how it gets built. It's also what we're building, right? So let's, all, let's also always keep that in mind. And that's really all I'm going to say about it. But, you know, if you're building canals on slave plantations to ship your sugar to the global market so that you can maintain your southern aristocratic, uh, you know, um, empire. That's 
who cares how it's financed, right? Um, so this is kind of washed out. Um, yeah, if the lights could be dim, maybe you, you don't have to read it really. This this is a um, this is one share of stock in the Philadelphia and Lancaster Turnpike Road Corporation. Uh, this is thought of as probably the first um, significant highway built in the United States, and it was privately financed. So those those proponents of privatization are not um, being fully dishonest when they say a lot of stuff in the United States was built via private finance. Um, but what's, what's key here is securitization. Securitization is best thought of as a technology, in, in my opinion. And what, what securitization provides for is the ability to raise capital from um, an enormous distributed number of individuals and institutions and use it immediately to um, finance something in particular. And we'll, I'll revisit securitization in a minute. Um, so, Brief, uh, so to, br to do this sort of historical sweep here, right, the early 1700s, 1800s in the United States, a lot of stuff is privately financed, turnpikes, canals, other forms of infrastructure. Here in California, they built this vast, weird infrastructure of things called plank roads, which um, connected uh, San Francisco and some of the other cities to the, the mines in the Sierra Nevadas, and they built um, tur turnpikes and highways, and pretty much all of those were privately owned and you paid a toll to, uh, to traverse them and the toll was the, secur the securitized revenue stream that was used to pay back the original lenders and so that's the, that was the breakthrough, that, that's been one of the, the, the most fundamental breakthroughs um, under capitalism and so that allowed for the construction eventually of things like the Golden Gate Bridge but by the time we get to the 1920s and the 1930s the historical suite brings us to a point where projects are just too big and complicated and important to have private investors building them. And so there's a political, a new, a new political philosophy really becomes hegemonic in the United States and that's the political philosophy of the public ownership of public goods. And uh, it's, it's um, represented in the New Deal and all of the projects that were built um, during the New Deal and it's represented very much in how World War II was financed and a lot of that infrastructure. And the Golden Gate Bridge is a fantastic example. And did any of you cross the Golden Gate Bridge to come here today? Lots of hands going up. Um, did, did any of you perchance drive by that giant construction project um, approaching the Golden Gate Bridge? Did you, did you notice all that? You know, they've got this, this huge tunnel and this, this um, bridge and it's all fancy and it's new. Did you know that that's in effect owned by a private French bank and a German construction corporation? Um, it's kind of interesting, right, because the Golden Gate Bridge was publicly financed, um, although a private banker from Sonoma County led the effort to have it built, and they, they named that original approach after him. It was called Doyle Drive, and what they tore down a few years ago, two years ago, was Doyle Drive, and they're replacing that with what they're calling the Presidio Parkway, and that's the thing that's owned by these private financial companies and um, this German construction company. Um, so 1940s, 50s, into the 60s, um, the idea that the public should own infrastructure and that the public should be in the driver's seat in terms of securitizing the revenue streams to pay for infrastructure re remains dominant in the United States. And so you have the construction of this thing, right? This is the federal, um, the US federal highway system that was um, designed under Eisenhower and mostly built under the Eisenhower presidency. And the securitized revenue stream there, I believe, is what gasoline taxes mostly and um, some other forms of revenue. So that's where you're getting your money to pay back the the um, bondholders, and the bondholders are, it is the private capital market still, for the most part, right? So uh, even under this notion of the, the public good, we haven't escaped um, the hegemony of capital. Capital is still um, private, the notion of the private ownership of capital is ultimately still um, driving this. Um, and we end up, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, we end up with the procurement and construction of just enormous infrastructure projects in the United States that create trillions and trillions of dollars in wealth and um, billions and billions of dollars in, in, in flows of income on a yearly basis. And so I live in Oakland, 
So I thought I would put a photo of the Port of Oakland up here. Port of Oakland is enormous. It's just enormous if you think about it. Um, they had to dredge all of these waterways. This is all landfill, so this is artificial land that they've built, right? And they've got these, these cranes and all of this infrastructure and this rail infrastructure and everything. It's an enormous project. And it's owned and it was built by a department of the city of Oakland. And by the way, Oakland is only, I think, the 45th largest city in the United States. It's actually kind of a small city. And yet, this small city of 400,000 people is able to build this massive infrastructure project. Okay, this is state and local government expenditures, 1990 to 2008. And um, sorry, 1990, I, I put this slide together this morning and I was like, I have to go back to 1945. And so I looked around on the internet and I couldn't find a, a, a data set to import into Excel really quickly to go back that far. So I just went back to 1990. But if you went back to, say, uh, World War II, the trend is more or less the same, right? It's going to look like this enormous growth over time in the amount of um, in the amount of expenditures on capital goods by state and local governments in particular. And the federal government would look similarly also. And this is kind of hard to read because the numbers there are hidden, but it's, we're talking in the hundreds of billions of dollars on a yearly basis for education, highways, all of that stuff. And when we say education, we're talking about like building schools, building highways, building so I guess, sewage ports, airports, stuff like that. So there's just enormous growth historically in terms of what we need to procure in society. Um, roughly 1995 to 2013, where, where we're at at the present, this is the total public construction spending. This is from the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. They have lots of really good um, economic data online, and, the, and you can just hit a button, and it'll graph it for you really quickly. And um, the reason I put this graph up there is, again, um, total procurement of infrastructure in the United States, mostly under this model that we get out of the 1920s through 1950s, that, that New Deal era where we think of the public good, the public ownership of infrastructure as being really important. Um, that's what this line represents, is public, public construction of publicly owned goods held in the public trust, securitized with revenue streams um, that are sometimes, uh, sometimes the revenue is um, general obligation tax sources. Most of the time, most of this upsweep here is going to represent um, business type enterprise. So that's um, uh, revenue bond debt, and I, I can explain that later if that's confusing, but that's like charging people um, a toll to cross the Golden Gate Bridge. That, that's like an enterprise type thing, whereas if you just take someone's property tax or the general sales taxes to build a school, that's more um, general obligation revenue streams. But the reason I put this slide up there, 2008, something happens, right? We all know what happened. Um, so there's a huge, there's a very significant decline in the amount of money that's being spent to procure public infrastructure. And we all know there's a public infrastructure deficit in the United States and bridges fall down from time to time and horrible things happen and we're not upkeeping the infrastructure we have. And the reason I put that up there is because that's one of the main arguments that the infrastructure privatization industry uses to advance their argument. The guy at the top is Peter Orzag. Uh, I think he ran, was it Office of Management and Budget? Um, in the Obama administration, he's um, sort of a wonder kind, uh, numbers guy, um, super intelligent, policy wonk, um, loves data, big data, and all that, as the Obama administration apparently does. And what he's, what he's arguing here is that the free market should build infrastructure, not governments. He's a Democrat, or he worked for a Democratic administration. The guy at the bottom is Robert Poole. He's, the Re he's of the Reason Foundation. He's one of the key intellectuals in um, advancing the ideology of privatization of, of infrastructure finance. And he's very important to us in this room. Um, I'm assuming most of you are from California. Some of you probably flew in from elsewhere. But if you're from California, he's very important because he spent the past 20, 30 years um, He's actually written laws that are on our books now that allow for the privatization of infrastructure. The Reason Foundation is a very important center of intellectual thought around um, how to 
make public procurement of highways and um, other infrastructure into an opportunity for private profit. So this is the Presidio uh, Parkway project in San Francisco. This is the road I mentioned at the outset that is owned by, a, uh, effectively owned, I wanna be really careful with my words here, it's not actually owned, because this is where it's the new privatization. It's effectively owned by a private French bank Call, well, it, an infrastructure fund called Meridium Infrastructure and a German construction corporation called Hope Tief. And last I checked, uh, cor corporate ownership is a um, tricky thing because people are constantly buying and selling each other, but last I checked about six months ago, Hope Tief in turn is owned by a Spanish construction corporation called ACS and Meridium is a, a part of the Credit Agricole Bank of France, but, it, but both of these um, have offices in New York, and that's sort of where they run their North American infrastructure privatization operations. And this imagery here, so the Presidio Parkway portion is this road that runs into those tunnels, and it goes underground, and then it pops out, and then it goes on these elevated uh, spans, and then it finally connects to the Golden Gate Bridge. So this slide isn't my slide, this slide it says source Caltrans, but it's actually not Caltrans slide either. This is Jose Luis uh, Moscovich's slide. He is the executive director of the San Francisco um, uh, Transportation Agency. So he's the, he's the public servant in charge of figuring out how to procure public infrastructure. And I put this slide in here because it sort of explains how he justified privatizing that particular span of roadway in San Francisco. He's saying, historically, cost, there are huge cost overruns on public, pr publicly procured projects, and that he is, right, the fear of cost overruns at the bottom of the slide, if you can see that, he is afraid of cost overruns, and a lot of public servants are afraid of cost overruns, and sometimes there are really big cost overruns on big um, infrastructure procurement projects. You're wasting the taxpayer dollars, or you're, you know, you're putting us in debt to these private banks for our infrastructure that we need in a way that's not helpful. So he's justifying privatization of infrastructure as a way of escaping cost overruns. How does that work? This is the, this really confusing slide, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to break it down. Um, this is how proponents of public-private partnerships of the new privatization justify allowing private corporations and banks to finance <clears throat> the construction of infrastructure in exchange for their ability to control the wealth that that infrastructure creates, right? their ability to gather the securitized revenue stream, be it tolls, be it um, user fees, be it whatever. So what they say is, here's on the left is the, the old clunky public sector comparator. Um, gosh, it's not very sophisticated, you know? And you've got the base cost and you've got the transaction cost. The base cost and the transaction cost are basically how much is it gonna cost to build and then you know, what are some what are some of the various costs that we have to pay the lawyers and so forth to like put all the documents together and you know uh, dot the I's and cross the T's. And then the financing costs, gee, that's pretty big too in the old model, but if you notice, the base and the transaction costs and the financing costs are actually less in the old model than they are in the public-private partnership model because even the people who advocate for privatization today know they can't claim that these costs are uh, less under the private model because obviously private debt is not tax exempt as is public debt, right? So when you issue a bond to build a road through a county, it's usually tax exempt. So usually you can secure that at a lower interest rate with better financing than you can say with a um, privately secured bond in the private capital market that, that comes with more cost. And the transaction costs are higher, and the financing costs are higher, and the base costs are higher. So what they say, they have this sophisticated notion of value for money where they say, under the old model, the public retains all the risk, the risk being cost overruns. What if there's a labor strike? Or for a, a really apt example here in the Bay Area right now, what if those bolts we installed on the Bay Bridge, what if, the, you know, what if something goes wrong? That'll be really expensive. And yeah, that stuff happens from time to time, right? And so what public-private partnership proponents say is, 
let us privatize the financing of the project, the construction of the project, and maybe even some other features of the project, and in exchange for that, we will agree to shoulder all the risk if something goes wrong. We will lose our equity, and the public will keep their equity. Does that make sense? Okay, I heard a couple different, yeah, no, we, can, we, can, we can go back over that in, the, in, in Q&A really quick, but, um, but basically, you know, you know how like risk has become this, this motif, this like zeitgeist of contemporary capitalism, and everybody's a risk manager now, and derivatives can, you know, handle all the risk of everything, and everyone's obsessed with risk under contemporary capitalism, and it's no different here in infrastructure um, finance, and so the, the, new, the new thing is, hey, offload, the public can offload some of its risk if it allows private parties to obtain more of the reward that can be gotten from controlling infrastructure. It's just like, you know, it's just like the stock market, right? They say, you know, if you invest in a risky stock, you could, you could lose your shirt, but you could also make a fortune, right? Risk. Um, so these are the forms of, so it's not actually privatization, right? I'm sure we all think of privatization. We think that you know we think Margaret Thatcher walks into a um, you know a, some sort of stately oak paneled boardroom and says, "Okay, we're going to sell off all the hospitals and all the canals and all the all the housing and um, highest bidder." Or you know, or um, Carlos Slim gets to buy the entire telephone system of Mexico or something like that, right? And they actually and the investors actually own it, right? The reason that P3 in the United States is not going to be that kind of privatization is because the private investors don't legally actually own the underlying asset. So on the, on the very left of this scale, DBB is design, bid, build. That's the clunky old New Deal model where the government designs a project and then says, hey, we need someone to build it. And so they put out bids and then bidders come back and they build the project. And it's completely, and the, the financing of the project and the construction of the project and the operations and the maintenance and everything, that's, that's always uh, completely controlled by the public entity. And the underlying asset is completely owned by the public entity. Does design build, design build finance, design build finance operate maintain, build operate own. So as you move from left to right, this is the spectrum of privatization, right? I believe the Presidio Parkway is a number four. I believe it's a design, build, finance, operate, maintain. The, um, and sorry, I haven't looked at the, um, this was six or seven months ago that I looked at all the documents, but I think it's, it's something like a 30 plus year contract under which the private parties agreed to design, design the second phase of the project, build the project, finance the construction with capital that they raise, supposedly, we'll get to that in a second, and then operate and maintain the project, but Caltrans and the San Francisco Transportation Authority will ultimately own the project. You still own it. So we, the public, still own it. That's great, right? It's not full privatization, right? That's great. Actually, it's not, because the reason they've created this very sophisticated uh, means by which the public still owns everything, but they just do all the work and, all, and take all the profits, is because under previous models of privatization, private investors have found it very inconvenient when things collapse and they actually own the asset, right? So they want to leave the public with the ownership of the asset because that's actually problematic, because that's risky. Remember, remember that other slide I had a second ago? It's kind of weird. So the whole promise is that we'll shoulder more of the risk if you just let us skim off more of the cream. But actually, unless you get to five, unless you get to a full, fully privatized form of infrastructure, finance, and procurement, build, own, operate, where you're letting private corporations actually just get right off the ground and just build, build something and own it, if you're at four or below, right, the public shoulders enormous risk. And there's examples, and I can talk about them in California where the public really got screwed in Orange County and San Diego with privatized highways in the 1990s and early 2000s, but I won't talk about them right here. Um, sorry, this is really uh, crowded. Uh, so the Presidio Parkway, the privatized road in San Francisco, it's being uh, the developer concessionaire 
right? So it's uh, Mina USA, which is Meridian, that's the French private investment bank. Hochtief, that's the German construction corporation. And then you've got, and what, the, what they do is these, these large construction corporations and infrastructure finance corporations, they, they team up in these big concession, concessionary um, teams to um, take over public infrastructure projects. So they've got four, uh, three or, yeah, they've got three different um, engineering and construction firms. They've got their financial advisor, their legal consultants. Oric Herring Harrington and Sutcliffe, probably a familiar name, San Francisco law firm, probably the biggest law firm in public finance. Um, they invent a lot of these clever laws and stuff, is what their lawyers do. Um, and at the bottom, the core lenders, Barclays, Merrill Lynch, Scotia Capital. So at the bottom, the core, the core underwriters, right, they're supposed to be the people who provide the private capital to build the public project. Supposed to be. And they do, they provide some. And the people toward the top, see where it says equity contributor toward the top? So Hoke Tiff, PPP Solutions North America and MENA USA, they're the ones providing the equity and so they're the ones who could really lose their investment if things go wrong, which things can still go wrong, right? The risk, who, how do you measure risk? Things can still go wrong, but they'll lose their equity. The core lenders at the bottom, they're bondholders. They can't really lose much here unless things go really wrong, right? Um, and the next few slides are gonna get really messy. I apologize, I'll try to explain them as we go through them. Um, so again, our example, this is drawn straight out of the business plan for that privatized road in San Francisco. Um, so at the very top, you have the senior milestone bonds, the, um, which are private activity bonds worth $150 million. So this is, this, is how they're built, this is how they're getting the money up front to build the project. Right? This is really important. This is, this, is the, this is the absolute core of what's going on here in infrastructure privatization. Tiffia loans, equity contributions, interest earnings, bang. So private activity bonds are tax exempt bonds. So if we're allowing a private, if we're allowing private finance to publicly procure something, why would you give them a private activity bond that isn't taxed at the market uh, as, a, as a private, right? If people are making private profit off it, why is it tax exempt? Well, that's how they make part of their money, right? So it's essentially a, f a federal and state taxpayer subsidy. Uh, the, the TIFIA loans, right, that was a 1998 um, program of, of the Clinton administration and Republicans and Democrats in the Congress. Transportation, Infrastructure, Finance, and Innovation Act. And what they mean by innovation is the ability to privatize things, but to do it by using, again, federal taxpayer subsidized loans to make things uh, much, to, to bring in more money. Um, if you, you'll notice the equity contribution is actually quite small, it's $44 million. This confusing slide, I, just, I, I don't even want to explain this, I just want to confuse you. This is how, the, this, okay, so if you read the uh, contract, the, the final agreement between, they call themselves Golden Link Concessionaire Limited Partners, and that's all those companies I was just talking about. If you read the contract between them and the state of California, this is how they determine how much the state pays the private concessionaire. The milestone payment about shall be, right, and then they have this funny little formula thing, 173 million, and then you have to adjust it, and it's really confusing. I can actually explain it, but I, I don't really want to, because it's just, it's, this is actually like a, um, this is like a 16 or 17 page document. The uh, agreement is 200 page, pages, it's very complicated. And we go through more formulas. It's all very confusing. Um, so this, this final slide right here is just to give you an idea of, so, so this new privatization hasn't really come here yet, right? We have a road in San Francisco. Um, we have some stuff in the East Coast in Maryland. They're considering some highways in LA. For the most part, 98% of infrastructure in the United States is still design, bid, build, classical um, stuff. Not, not privatized financial models that allow these organizations to skim cream off the top. But it's coming, and these are the major players in this industry. At the top is the Macquarie Group, Goldman Sachs. You can go down the list. Some of these names are probably familiar to some of you. Um, toward the bottom, I want, oh yes. 
seed number 27, it's kind of blurry, Actividades de Construcción y Servicios. That's the Spanish corporation that owns the German corporation that owns the road in San Francisco. And they're big, and they're here. And, the, and you can, I, I, I've got lobbying records, you can dig through them if you want, they're, on, they're online. And um, they're, they're, they're engaging with different officials in different states and the federal government to attempt to privatize more infrastructure. They just privatized the um, airport in Puerto Rico under a pilot program. They wanna privatize the Chicago Midway Airport. So this public-private partnership model, it extends from highways and roads to ports and to airports. And there's a, um, the Long Beach County Courthouse is actually now privately financed um, under the same model. So it's coming, so don't be surprised if you read about it in the newspapers. Okay. <laughs>